This week, we have not one, but two doctors on the show, uh, one of which is Dr. Kevin Harris. He's the Program Director for Information System Security and Information Technology Management. Wow, that's a long title. At the American Public University System, and he's here to talk about the ethics, or lack thereof, of surveillance. In our second segment, we welcome back Bryson Bort. He's the founder and CEO of Scythe. He's going to demonstrate how to safely simulate ransomware and multi-staged APT with lateral movement in your production environment as well as make a really awesome announcement. In the security news, U.S. CERT is warns of remotely exploitable bugs in medical devices. McDonald's Hamburglar account attack. No, YouTube isn't planning to jettison your unprofitable channel, or at least that's what Google wants us all to believe, and we're going to tell you otherwise. And more McDonald's Hamburglar account attack and how memes could be our secret weapon against pesky bots. It sounds ludicrous, but it has merit in my opinion. And we'll learn ab all about all that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to graphwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Qualys is introducing a new prescription for security, and it's free. Global IT asset discovery and inventory. Activate it today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys so you can achieve 100% near real-time visibility across your hybrid environments. As a doctor, my patients rely on me to give them sound medical advice. And when patients ask me about what to do about the constant drip, 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 and stinging sensation associated with bad OPSEC, I tell them 10 cc's of pure acidorian in a bourbon suspension administered orally. Side effects may include gender asphasia, species dysmorphia, and or death. Here's Paul. Welcome everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. It's episode number 627 recorded on November November, that's what the tele <laughs> November 14th, 2019, right sure here in G Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Uh, to my left, they call him the doctor. It's Dr. Doug. What's up, Doug? I'm hooked on phonics. <laughs> or a missing B or something like that. November, November. We listen to Doug because we just want to hear what he's going to say next. That's really. That's what I keep doing. <laughs> <laughs> On the lines remotely, Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Jeff, welcome. Hey, thanks. I feel like I haven't been here in a long time. Uh, so, you, yeah, well, you have your own show now, so yeah. you know, you're slumming it with oh, us. Oh, yeah, on there's that. I am, Weekly. Yeah, left it all behind a little bit. Yes. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Uh, hey, we have some martinis here. Uh, Mr. Lee Neely is here with us as well, remotely, anyhow. Wish he was here in studio. That is one big glass of wine, my friend. Well, That's the whole bottle. makes a generous pour. It's great to be here. Feels like we haven't been here in a couple of weeks. And, yes. Uh, just recently took a quick tour of Vietnam, covered almost the entire country. That was amazing. Sweet. Now looking forward to cutting it up with a little security. <sighs> That's right. Mr. Joff right. Thayer is here with us remotely as well. Joff, welcome. Get a poll, P C I E I E I O, I think. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> 
it's good to see you guys. Uh, it's great. It's great that Doug's on the show. I think. Uh, Although I'm not really that. sure. <laughs> you know you love me. Uh, I don't. Is there an announcement in the? Oh yeah. Oh, Tyler's here as well. Yes. Yeah. There's Tyler. Oh, there's Ooh, Tyler. look at that. He's in a in a restaurant somewhere. It's very noisy. Yeah, and he has we won't, we won't talk to him, but we can just look at him every once in a while. We'll just cut to Tyler every once in a while. We'll all go, ooh, ah, Tyler. He's doing live animal experimentation or something like <laughs> so, that. He's got monkeys in cages in the background. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of pig squealing going on, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, register for one of our or all of our upcoming webcasts with Kevin O'Brien of Great Horn or Steve Lobenstein of Core Security or both. By going to securityweekly.com, click the webcast drop-down menu, select registration. Of course, our previously recorded webcasts are there if you click the on-demand link in that same drop-down menu. If you attend any of our webcasts, you will get one CPE credit per webcast. I would now like to introduce our special guest for this segment, Dr. Kevin Harris. As I said, and I'll say it again because it's a really long and awesome title, Program Director for Information System Security and Information Technology Management at American Public University System. Did I get that right, Kevin? Drink. You got it. You got it. Appreciate you all giving me time. Yes, it's nice to have you. Nice to have you on the show, Kevin. Um, if you could start and just give us a little bit about your background and how you got started in information security. Yep. So appreciate it. So my background um, started in IT, um, doing support, um, then worked as a system analyst for a while. And at that time, we were doing networking and infrastructure. And at that time, there wasn't a definition of a word security per se. Um, that's before it became uh, sexy it is today with cybersecurity and information system security. We were looking at logs, um, trying to set things up and keep it securely with access. And so that was kind of my introduction, uh, being an analyst um, and working in the network uh, infrastructure. So progressed on up through um, the IT areas, worked as a CIO for a little bit and um, transitioned over to the cyber area. Yeah, so what is your role today, Kevin? Yep. So today, um, work with our curriculum, um, cybersecurity, information system security, IT, just um, making sure that our students are prepared to go into the workforce and they've got the skills that they need to go on and help um, other companies and organizations mainly focus on securing data. And how did you come about uh, the topic of the ethics of surveillance? Yeah, so so it's one of the things I've been looking at lately in ethics of surveillance, the color of surveillance, um, an area that I've looked at for a while has worked around um, digital uh, divide. But just now as we move into surveillance, and it's given us a lot of unique tools and new tools that we can really help monitor our own security, you know, whether it's our personal security or company security. If you kind of think about it today, even um, if we leave home and we forget whether we've left our garage door over, we can check to see if that's closed. It's drastically different from when, you know, we were a kid and coming home and, you know, whether somebody came home with us, friends after school, you know, that was, we had to be trusted. Yeah, it's so a, we're now, I, and I was thinking about that this morning because um, I want to say it was maybe 10 years ago or so where folks in our community were basically proclaiming that privacy is dead. And... I, I don't I didn't disagree at the time, uh, but I always thought that it could be even more dead than it was <laughs> ten years ago. And pulling into work this morning, I really had that epiphany as we've got the new uh, alarm system here that you can arm and disarm from your phone. I can't wait to hack that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and in my home, how I have surveillance, how my neighbors have ring doorbells, and there's all these you know inc incidents lately that I'm like, you know, it's really hard to achieve privacy these days and i'll give you an example someone walking their dog in the neighborhood dog drops a deuce in front of the person's house now it gets caught on the ring doorbell uh -huh. and so you know post gets made to social media and in all these other things right and and even in front of my own home like if i want to go back and take a nap 
because I'm tired after everyone goes to work. I, I, I have cameras. Now I'm going to – I got to disconnect the internet from my house. Or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Go through great lengths. I just – I want to go take a nap. Right? Can't you just write a script to loop yourself in doing something yes. productive like yes. washing dishes washing or something? Washing dishes and, and it's laundry. Just like, That's what I need like, to do. You know. But and the oh. epiphany was like this relationship now is not – Yes, these devices in our homes and businesses provide a level of security, but at what cost, right? That relationship we have with them is is pretty uh, uh, like difficult one, right? It really is. And talking to people, even friends, you know, a lot of people have that thought process is I don't have anything to hide, so I don't care. It's out there. The information's there. And they really don't realize, like from my perspective, how, you know, everyone has something that they should be concerned about uh, regardless even these devices what if somebody tracks like you were saying where are you coming and going you know if you're asleep or home if somebody else access that then they oh, we know every day no one's home between x and x and so even if you don't have anything to hide you really should have that to hide of when, when you're coming and going so someone doesn't break into your house so i mean i think just getting the awareness level out there is just so important so but does, early- it, does it raise the level of ethics right does it uh, make people act in a more ethical manner because they know that they're going to be tracked well I, it. i'm sorry one of the first things i saw with this was when uh, companies started we were interviewing people and i started going to myspace and looking people up that we were interviewing for right. jobs and one in this candidate we had for a cfo position what i had a myspace page showing this person uh, actually doing lines of coke off of the of a table on the page, and sh- uh, the person didn't get the job, and she I, said, "It was a table, not a hook." Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't me. <laughs> I, but um, but I mean, I, I I saw that, and I started thinking about the ethics of that, and it, I think if you're a Kohlbergian pre-conventionalist, it does. I mean, if, if you're if you're that kind of person that you know, if a camera's on you, you wouldn't you wouldn't steal a wallet. Then yeah, it's gonna it's definitely. Right. I mean, that's why they use security cameras. I mean, the incidence of people being attacked goes down if they put a put a camera on something. It doesn't even have to be real. Well, it doesn't have to be real. We had fake ones. A lot of places I worked had little cameras yeah. that moved and a little yeah. red light on it. And you'd see people looking at it going, is that guy getting ready to kill me? Like, that camera works, man. I'm telling you. It's not cheap plastic with a 9-volt battery in it, I swear. I think it's like it's like antivirus, right? Like, it, it deters those 80% of people, right? And then you have the other, you know, determined attackers, determined thieves, whatever you want to call it, those are the those are the people that you want to record. So cameras are always a deterrent when we're doing big physicals. But just because there's a camera there doesn't always mean someone's watching. And exactly. usually we'll do it without. Right. And if you know those things, you can go right past the camera and not even bat an eye because you know exactly what model that fake camera is because you saw it, you have, you know, you wouldn't looked at them at, that, uh, at the or fake you, camera store. Yeah, most of them are wife. Anyway, Kevin, I want to get your thoughts on this. Sorry. But, well, and, and with that, even with the cameras, the data that's being recorded, who are we comfortable having access to the data? You know, Mm -hmm. so I think that's, you know, maybe we're okay with our employer having it. Maybe we're okay with that, but maybe we aren't okay with various government agencies having access uh, to our data and what happens when someone gets access to our data, where does it go from then? You know, what all these companies and like you mentioned, your neighbors and our neighbors are collecting data, who gets access to it once they record it? You know, I think that's a, big concern there too yeah is is a warrant even your local police force is a warrant enough of a checks and balance systems to gain access to this data because what if they're investigating a crime and they see that you know doug's uh got a a warrant for him but in the logs doug's phone's connected to the wi-fi and they're like hmm doug was here now i can go arrest doug even though that had nothing to do with my other investigation Mm -hmm. of you know someone getting beat up or whatever and the courts won't catch up with that for a while yeah I mean, that's... And we just arrest Doug on principle anyway. Yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can download all those videos until they take the YouTube feed down. Kevin, what's your students' kind of take on this? And do you, do you have an ethics class in the uh, computer curriculum? Yeah, so we, we look at it. Uh, we've got a couple ethics class. And we've got a um, guess large percentage of students that are military, military background. So I think they look, look at that as that's the cost of... Um, you know, security that giving up some of the privacy rights, uh, our cost of securing the environment, 
But, you know, we do have, we get in some good discussions there back and forth with, you know, how far are we willing to go on that kind of continuum of privacy versus security? Um, are we, you know, willing to give up our privacy for, you know, a more secure environment? And, I, you know, it varies, but I, I think a lot of our students are more willing and you know, interested in giving up a little bit more of the uh, security, um, a look for privacy for security. Hmm. Oh. That's interesting. Do you, do you think I have a question? I, I, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll let them ask. Was, so I was I I was wondering. Um, I remembered back. I don't remember what year it was when the business that London had all those outdoor cameras watching everybody, and yeah. there was a big uproar. And now you go to somebody's house, and they've got a camera sitting on the mantle as you're sitting there having you know coffee or drinks or whatever with them. Is there not on, not just an ethics problem? Is there an etiquette problem here? Um, are we becoming the, or are we just becoming desensitized, and we're not going to see them anymore? Well, I, I think that is something. Even where we're places, if you've noticed at restaurants, you know, people are, uh, you know, doing videos. They're, you know, live, um, going live online. And so what they're capturing in the background, does everyone there want to be captured in the background? I, I think as a society, we are going more that that route of just being desensitized it, it's okay um but it's kind of like you have to opt out to not want something posted Chuck, i thought oh. you're gonna say something so. <laughs> well I, yeah what I, I was thinking about that question too i, I mean i but my other question was, do you think you can teach ethics? I, I mean, I, I've uh -huh. always had this sort of running debate about, you know, I, I, when I, I was first putting a security program together uh, in, long ago, the, the first cybersecurity program I built was in 99. And one of the questions that got asked at, the, at that university was, why don't you have ethics in this curriculum? You, you've got to teach people ethics or they're going to misbehave with this dangerous knowledge we're giving them. And, and my argument was, well, we teach biology without ethics. We teach all these other sciences without ethics. And maybe that's good or bad. I'm not saying. But I was like, I don't want to sacrifice one of my three credit sequences for this class when I'm not even totally convinced that you can, can, you can change someone's ethics. You can teach them about ethics and you can have them talk about ethics, but I'm not totally convinced that I can teach you to be ethical when you're 25 years old. It's a difference between awareness and training. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I think one of the things with that is, um, and I'm guilty of this too, just being in tech, I think a lot of times, in tech, we want to implement the new technologies and new innovation. We we want to we want to put it out there. We want to start playing with it. I used to work with somebody. He would always try to say, uh, "Let's do it in the name of science." That was his way of saying, "Let's try it regardless." But, but I think raising that awareness and saying, "Okay, we always don't need to implement the new technology. Let's kind of dial it back a little bit and think about it um, before we flip that switch to turn it on." that what are some of these uh, implications that it might have on people. But don't you think we need to be pushing that way back down? Because some of us, for many of us, it's too late. I mean, when somebody comes in my lab and says, what if we irradiate this chicken and, and it turns into like a mutant chicken that takes over the world, I'm going to be like, hit it, you know. But I, I mean, I, you know, like that sounds cool. We just but, need Peter Griffin to get into a fist fight with it. And <laughs> exactly. Be good. And then that's how you get there. But I mean, but I mean, I, I, to me, it was like you're trying to teach these college students ethics. And, you know, we had people cheating. We had all kinds of issues that were going on. And, and all the, you know, they, they spent all this money on these ethics training sections to get people not to cheat. And, you know, we were looking at it. I was seeing the same level of cheating I saw before they spent $150,000 on these mottos they put on the wall. And, you know, well, ethics is important, you know, and, and I just didn't buy it. And I'm not sure I buy it today. Yeah, if, well, if you're unethical, eth why are you going to pay attention? Right, I mean, to the un unethical trade. people signed the ethics pledge right away and went, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board, man. I mean, I'm there." <laughs> and you know, I was like, "If I sign this now, can I skip the rest of the training?" Because, <laughs> you know, and 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 you know, they're like, "Oh no, that that would be unethical in and of itself." And I'm like, "Okay, I I think I see where you're going with this." <laughs> I mean, yeah. Tyler, Eth ethics is similar to compliance, right? Like. Everybody is going to check that box as compliant because they don't want to get fined. They uh -huh. will will find that gray line to to walk, but that compliance doesn't equal equal security. And ethics is, I think, in the in that same category. Here, here. Right. 
But Joff, you, you have to drink. That was compliance. Uh, hey. <laughs> It, oh shit! Oh, forgot. Almost fuck out the drink. Yeah, it's um, interesting though, Kevin. No, no, I think oh, ahead, I'm kind of on Doug's pages a uh, here a little bit. I think uh, ethics is one of those things that you are not born with, but but you are trained into. And those people that are not, uh, they're not going to learn it quickly or easily. Just my opinion. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Kevin, uh, ethics is you know a, a two way street, right? And you bring up some very good points in your notes about. Uh, surveillance in the consumer aspect. We talked about people's homes in the government aspect, um, you know, body cameras and drones and that kind of thing. Uh, the privatization of it, right? Corporate owned. I talked about the alarm system here. So with things like GDPR, we want privacy of our data. How do we opt out of and maintain privacy in the surveillance state? How do we say, yeah, no, I don't want to be in the background of someone's Facebook live stream. And when I walk by my neighbor's house, I don't want to be on camera all the time. And I don't want people picking up what I say in a restaurant, uh, you know, camera. Is, is that enter the discussions uh, in with your students? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely does enter just the discussions of talking about it. And then even as you all bring it out that everybody, you know, ethics is different. But I think that's why it's important to like – we talk about policies and legislation so that we set some of those ethics that are out there um, and take away the kind of ethical responsibility and make sure that the tech sector has ethics, but also that, you know, it's interdisciplinary. So those policymakers and, you know, other um, units of companies have that built into the structure of companies that, hey, we're not going to use our product in this way. We're not going to allow this to happen with our products. Um, we're not going to pilot certain programs and certain, uh, you know, that only focus on certain segments of our community. You know, I think those things are, even if the technical person doesn't understand that and somebody can set the, the policy that kind of limit some of that, it, it helps those conversations. Yeah, yeah it's, what, it's interesting for my privacy if I were to and, uh, you know, Tyler, you someone alluded to this, right? I get the laser pointer and I point it at the camera. I spray paint the camera. I do a Wi-Fi denial of service attack. And that means like everyone's Wi-Fi goes down and surveillance for conceivably all of those systems goes down all at once just to protect one person's privacy. What if there's someone else who is seemingly more unethical than I am, pun intended, sort of, <laughs> like, right? Uh, if they commit some crime, like while that's happening, right? So I think it's a very interesting kind of dynamic we have but but i think this genie's out of the bottle and I'm, kevin may want to disagree with me but i mean i i don't think we're going to roll this back i i think that we have already gone Thank down you. the slippery slope we've got ring doorbells on every house the police the smart police want body cams i mean they want them right because that protects them when they are wrongfully accused Correct. and you know and and, it, and they want their you know their comrades to not be doing bad things typically yeah so I, I, people want dashboard cams, so when they get in an accident, that they, there's a record of what happened, and that guy saying, "Oh no, uh, he hit me," and and you know, and there's a road rage, and there's a school shooter, and on and on and on. I don't think you're going to stuff this back in any kind of privacy bottle. The danger, I think, that's still out there that we haven't dealt with, but we're starting to have to deal with, is what you said earlier. Is our data going to be reused against us? Right. Is an insurance company going to sit down and they're going to take video from your Facebook page and say, your lifestyle sucks? Uh, I saw I you know. on that show drinking martinis. What you're and, talking about, Doug? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, they're going to be like, mm -hmm. we saw you with that cigar and that martini on Security Weekly 19 Shh, my times. My insurance company might be... Oh, mine is. They already canceled my policy. <laughs> in fact, I saw the text come in a few minutes ago. Right. But, I mean, I do see them doing that because that's money. And I'm not sure how we stop that. We can pass all kinds of laws, but I don't know if they're going to stop that because there's, there's this weird global thing going on. And then if they move it offshore and say, well, we aren't subject to that law and blah, 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 it's just going to get complicated. So I don't know how we get back to where people seem to want to get to, like 1930 or something. So uh, around that, that's an interesting kind of dynamic though, right? Like if you don't have this stuff written down and you don't have these classes and you're not building a standard around something, then it's all perspective. Uh, one person's ethic or one company's ethics uh, are definitely not the same as another one. Mm -hmm. Take uh, something like uh, Ancestry.com or one of the genealogy ones. Right. 
at what point are those, is that particular data set or those genomic sequences going to be leveraged or bought or paid for yep. by life insurance companies as you know, pre-cancer markers or for your children's pre-cancer markers? Like, these are things that I don't, like this is already happening. I don't think we're rolling it back. So how do you take the next steps to protect what you're currently doing? Right, and that's without... a slippery slope, Tyler, because I don't have to go do those things. If enough of my family does, then yep. exactly. you don't even matter. Just like yep. Facebook, right? Like whoever tags yes. you, and puts a picture. <laughs> you can't uh -huh. control your grandma. Right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and with those, you know, when we talk about that, Tyler, like the DNA markers, you know, like even we've seen that used in those examples that one family member went in and, you know, wanted to use it, whichever one of the, you know, Ancestry.com or whichever it was. And then there was another family member lines down that they were able to find. They were, you know, um, you know, had committed a crime some years ago. Yep. So it's the same thing. You know, that family member didn't do anything, but they were kind of able to use that information. This is what uh, this is what AI and uh, ML and quantum computing like. This is what all of these things I think are eventually leading up to. These genomic sequences, these large big data sets, and, and big data analytics at itself is is really a pretty big deal. So we're at that precipice where I think the privacy things well they're not going to make a huge difference. They still need to be put in place because they may slow things down. They may put some, uh, some kind of protections around them for maybe a, a little bit of protection in the future, but still like, again, we're already at that point. I think we're well past, uh, you know, there's, there's enough data there, whether you want it to be or not, that mm. whether it's a government or businesses, they have that data. So people aren't caring. And we're going to drink again because Tyler said big data. Oh, man. Oh, Thank shit. And ML. Yeah. Thank you for that. And well, machine yeah. learning and AI. And, AI. and, and, and uh, Kevin, well, artificial it, intelligence and I'll neural just, I'll just get the well. bottle. I think, I, but I think that's a nice segue into uh, a, a topic on AI that leads into uh, not just racial bias, right, but all types of bias that are inherently built into AI because it's humans that are building and training those models. And hey, Kevin, I don't know if you've done uh, research on that. We've had one segment this year with Wynn Schwartow uh, actually on, on that topic, but um, I was curious where your research has led you in that area. Yeah. I mean, when, when you talk about gender bias or racial bias, you know, with so much of this, you know, it has a potential. I saw that uh, Wozniak just said that, you know, he had got improved for, I think, 10 times the um, credit that his wife did even though they have the same assets, her credit score was higher than his. Um, the One of the only limited uh, things that were different that they when they applied for their uh, Apple card was that, you know, she was a male, she was female. And so, I mean, as we're giving computers more ability to make choices, you know, these biases are built in. And a lot of times, some of the biases are built in because we don't have a diverse set of designers or testers that are using it to catch these things earlier so it's really important you know it's another um reason that we should have you know a diverse population of coders and you know that our tech community needs to be diverse yeah and, and it's interesting too when, when we build systems to analyze data for security it's it's really all about biases right like we're allowing the computer to run a model that's our best guess but it's basically a bias based on the data that we're feeding it that's bubbling up a certain event or series of events to go this is something you should pay attention to as an analyst or this is the credit limit that you should give someone which is kind of interesting i never really thought of it that way well any any good statistician will tell you that your prediction is only as good as the population that you're examining and yeah. when you limit the population like kevin said you know if it's, if it's racially biased to start with or it's gender biased to start with mm -hmm. it that's the population you're measuring. That doesn't mean you're measuring everyone, but we often make the assumption that we're measuring everybody when we're really measuring some other population we can't even adequately define. And that's mm -hmm. one of those, you know, horrors of statistics where we, we get into that kind of stuff. And AI learns these horrible traits from us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. yes, which is what scares me about AI. Uh, and uh, Kevin, you had something you want to talk about with the, the targeting of various like religious groups and activists and ethics group is that on the surveillance side or the ai side or a combination of both kind of combination of first and it's our comfort combination of both but it's our com comfort level i think if we you know 
all say, you know, should we use uh, AI or our data sets and surveillance to help identify, you know, terrorists? Everyone would probably be in agreement, you know, that's, that's a great thing. But then it's how is that determined of who's likely to be a terrorist? You know, and then when we start going out and saying, um, you know, like Doug said, what's statistics behind it? And so then if we start targeting certain communities and placing certain surveillance there, you know, is it a self predicting prophecy? If you put more surveillance in a certain area, are you going to catch more people committing crimes? And is, is that population actually committing more crime or is the surveillance, you know, creating a situation that you're able to right. uh, find people that are committing that crime? Jeff. Uh, so two comments and it's been bubbling up inside of me, uh, on what you just said, comment is simply minority report. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but, but related to that, I think, uh, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts or how, what kind of thoughts or things you're doing with all of this surveillance and even bleeding into AI in terms of sort of a new trend, at least in conference talks, because it seems that all I do is go to conferences these days, and that would be deep fakes. I mean, with the, the deep fakes, you know, it, it's another thing. So if you're, you know, do your eyes deceive you? You know, is really, can you trust what you're seeing and hearing now? You know, so I think that's that's another thing, but that's awareness is there's a large, you know, population that, you know, probably could see anything and they wouldn't understand, you know, a deep fake or, you know, that that's a possibility. So even, you know, with the surveillance or using AI, that if, you know, we've got a large portion of our community that's not aware of some of these, you know, um, things that can happen, you know, then, then that's the risk of them actually believing it. But I because I still believe that mu much of society today is still in that trust but verify. And when we start allowing a AI to create things like deep fakes or start relying on surveillance that's all digital, uh, we inherently as humans, we, we trust it. But if something doesn't look right, we might we might try and go verify that. And what I hope is that we start flipping that model. As all these things go digital, a lot of these things go AI, right, to produce some type of result, are we going to trust that or are we going to verify it before we actually trust it? And I think that's the case with deep fakes. And as how well. do you verify hey, look, it? Like, yeah, my friend was in a, you know, a porn video, right? And like you just, was, a lot of people just blindly trust that, like Kevin was saying. Like, oh, I, just but I mean, I don't even people. know how you verify some of this stuff unless you start putting, you know, right, hashes or something on, on, mm -hmm. the, on video to say I put my personal signature on this video to prove it was me because, you know, I, I mean, we, you don't even know that we're here right now. We could all be just like, you know, artifacts of the thermostat True. system projecting us because it got smarter <laughs> over, over time. And I, that's worrisome because I don't know how we stop that. I mean, yeah, if, if my dashboard camera is, is completely faked or I download some algorithms, it'll let me fake it so that it, you know, blots out any accidents I'm in or, you know, erases the alcohol the, <laughs> from the car image. <laughs> Well, I, I think if it's, it's something I think good, it's, I might put my hash on and go, yep, that was me. Yep, totally absolutely. Me. That, deep, that deep porn <laughs> fake was indeed me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but well, someday, people, if it's someday, on the internet, it's true. Right. Yeah, someday, you know, someday deep fakes is going to go beyond porn and revenge porn and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, what happens when you get into a surveillance situation and, and, you know, I can see it in both directions. Do you do you trust the video evidence or don't you trust the video evidence? And how do you validate or verify that it's real or fake? Because, you know, two things could happen. Somebody could be digitally removed or somebody could be mm -hmm. digitally inserted. And, and I can only imagine that as technology advances, the algorithms that are enabling the creation of what we're calling deep fakes is only going to get better and better. And, and, and you know, as a, as a hacker, I can certainly think of lots of ways that that can be abused. And I'm not sure that we're really prepared for how to address all the things that could, could happen and go on. We just need that yeah. test for replicants. Yeah, exactly. So Where's the, the void comp test right now? Prelude to, to our story. You see a tortoise lying in the road. Yeah. <laughs> what's that? What's that famous science fiction movie from the? T it was like a TV movie from the seventies, and if you had glasses on, you could see all the aliens had taken uh, over. Uh, 
They oh, live. They live. Yeah. They, they live. live. Thank With you. Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yes, that's the yes. one. That's the the epic fight scene. It was directed by John Carpenter. Uh, ah, yes, yeah. yes. I knew Doug would know the reference. Yeah, what was classic. it? But uh, a V was pretty similar, right? Yeah, V was another one, like but us. it was yeah. like, yeah, you could, the aliens all looked human to save budget. <laughs> 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 uh, the, the old trick of special effects, like, no, they look just like humans. It's like it was an illusion. Uh, X Files did that too, right? Yeah, they yeah. did. Yeah, well, it was early like, deep fake, really, is what we're talking about. Right. Yeah, there's already a lot of work around like identifying a lot of these deep fakes. These are currently actively being used by several APT groups yep. and, and or criminals. So, you know, I think we've already passed that point of, you know, deep fakes being leveraged for commercial gain or nefarious reasons. So we're at that point where now, you know, how bad does this get? Uh, we leverage it pretty frequently for, for engagements. It takes a substantial amount of personas and, and personalities to embed into a lot of these different groups or you know ethnic or diverse areas, and it's really hard to do quickly at scale without doing that. So you know both ways can be used. Uh, Facebook and, and uh, LinkedIn both are heavily combating this by having algorithms and AI and machine learning and all this stuff around trying to identify those markers. But like Joff was saying, as those markers get harder to detect and those data sets become uh, less and less human interactive, that's when it starts to get really scary where you guys are talking like, how do we, how do we set up and prepare for that moving forward? All of a sudden, I'm not convinced that we're talking to Tyler. <laughs> yeah, I well, was, I think, I was I never convinced we were talking to, to good, Tyler. I think it comes back to good security practices, right? I mean, you know, we, unfortunately, I think in the industry, we've not done a good job of promoting technologies that, um, that actually allow people uh, to validate authenticity of the sender, that allow to validate things like non-repudiation. Um, you know, if we had done a better job of that, uh, where, where people had an instinctive go-to, like, okay, I see a video, how do I verify? There is a technology for me to verify by either looking at a hash, looking at some sort of digital signature, looking at some sort of authenticity chain, whatever that is. Um, then, uh, the, you know, the deep fake uh, would be would be much more challenging. But but we have not done a good job of implementing technologies like that. Well, and, I think and that and is the, root, the essence of the problem. The root cause even further than that, Joff, is because, you know, we've we've relied on security to take care of it. And it hasn't. If only we had paid more attention to compliance. Oh, well, I, well oh, it, I mean, oh, both, hold on. Hold it. on. Both Joff and Jeff, I think, have a, a valid yes. points. Um, that the way that we've been trained since the dawn of computing to validate our identity is with the username and password. And that mm -hmm. was the very first early way in the first computer systems to validate who you are so that only you could see your files. It was more about protecting your files than your identity. Yes. And, and I agree, Jeff, compliance still, I think, requires that but as a security measure right and joff i, I like your point because we talk about how identity is so important today and it's a difficult challenge because we're stuck in the 50 plus years ago when someone created the password that that's the way we validate our identity and then we came up with this preposterous thing that of multi-factor authentication which okay i don't have just one password now i have basically two <laughs> passwords and that's supposed to validate my identity i think it needs to extend into what joff was alluding to is how do i have a digital signature a better way to verify that paul is paul that not only helps against deep fakes but it also helps us in a lot of countries right you've got your digital identity uh, your passwordless system that gives you access to the government resources. And yes, there are vulnerabilities, but just like anything, of course there are. But it's a better way to verify your identity. Security needs I mean, to go it, in that direction. It, exactly think, right. And I think a classic example uh, is is the PGP example or GPG example, however you want, however you want to term it. Uh, but, you know, that technology did not get integrated into the mainstream, and yet um, the the concept... Um, of of implementing uh, public private key cryptography for uh, for, for, for the uh, you know verification of the of the authentic source um, means something significant mm -hmm. um, and and we've used it in other ways right we've used it for key exchange all around the internet but we've kind of stopped and I think we need to take it further I think uh, in particularly public private key uh, 
cryptography is one of the most important advances that we have, and we need to push on that lever a little bit further uh, and, and, and use it um, – you know, for more of the validation tasks that we require. Well, let's well, hold, 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 wait, wait, hold on. Kevin, Kevin had a comment. <laughs> and and I think as we talk about this, as we're introducing new technologies, like someone bought it before, that it can't be looked at as we've got the design team or the innovation team, and then we've got the security team. Because a lot of time what happens there is a new product gets developed and then it gets pushed to release prior to the security team being able to implement new security measures with it and do some of the things that we've talked about versus if the security was part of the design um, stage and the individuals that were on the design team were focused on security um, as well as the innovation and the new tech um, of getting it out, out to order. Jeff. Well, and just to clarify what I was saying earlier about compliance, and you know, I was taking a jab at Jeff, but security alone, which is what most of us think of we've had up to this point, isn't getting the job done. Uh, I would still maintain that the only thing that's going to make a difference is regula regulation and compliance. You know, somebody holding somebody's feet to the fire. Other, you know, otherwise, what are what are the motivators for for uh, any of this to change? And the and the only analogy I can think of that kind of comes close is think about the automotive industry when i was a kid probably when doug was a kid too uh cars didn't have seat belts i don't know if airbags had even been invented yet they had horses um, that pulled a, yeah there was this a, thing a in bucket. front called yeah. a horse <laughs> yeah yeah there was a, there was a board hey, wilbur <laughs> I mean, I, I remember being a kid going to the beach in, in the parents' station wagon, and, and you know, we had a large family, and they would throw blankets and towels on top of all the luggage in the back of the station wagon and let me climb up there and, and you know, hang out. And, you know, to, my, to this day, I think, wow, I was just a torpedo ready to be launched. But I'm sure I'm not the only kid that grew up that way. But, you know, what made the auto industry change? It, it wasn't all the companies voluntarily saying, wow, we should put safety systems in. It, it, was, it was regulation. Yeah. Well, I, with I, I will say. Regulation with a background, which is compliance. But I will say. What, I think it's going to be a mix of both. I think really it's going to be a mix of both. We're talking about carrot and stick. And yeah. uh, I think in order to solve some of these problems, we're going to have some of what Jeff uh, likes because he's a very big, big proponent of sticks. Uh, and we're going to need some technology to be to be the carrots. But rep, non repudiation is one of the things that's going to tie all this together, because that that's the non repudiation is stuck in like the 17th century. Two yeah, years ago, two years ago, I was arguing with someone on a campus who said no, that. No, get out! Imagine that. <laughs> who said that a, a little scribble in a little box that no one could read was far more important than an email verification because you know my signature, my word is my bond. And I said I'm going to order some sealing wax so you can verify. You know, and it comes from the king because my ring is the only one like it. And we still aren't very close to that, and that saves us from deep fakes. I mean, I'm talking about like large scale non repudiation. So if, if you have a crystal embedded in your forehead that verifies your identity, you know, then when the deep fake comes, it's like, no, that's not his crystal. It's something else. And it's an infinity stone that brings the vision? To it's, a, anyway. it's a stone of infinity, maybe. <laughs> I, I, you know, something like that. Well, yeah. I, I, I agree with Joff, though. I, I think it's a both and, but I think uh, you know, regulation is going to drive change, and then people are going to try to find cost-effective automated you know, technology ways to solve the problem. But, uh, you know, they're not going to solve the problem with technology if there's no market to sell it. And the only way that there's a market to sell it is if there's regulation. Uh, uh, Kevin, <laughs> closing closing well, thoughts before we get to five questions. All right. No, j just as we're talking about, uh, you know, market, I think a lot of it too goes to the market. You know, once someone gets our data, they willing to sell it how much are they willing to sell it for and even we give up some of our surveillance with rewards programs with um, apps that we download for different stores that we go into you know they survey um what aisles that we go in what products we stop and take a look at you know all that can be sold um to someone either to their you know even to their competitors that are in the same uh, retail uh, space um if if that's another revenue stream for them to look at that. Uh, Kevin, we just have five questions left for you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? 
<laughs> Let's do it. There are no right or wrong answers in one question. <laughs> is multiple choice with only two possible selections. So, <laughs> Kevin, three words to describe yourself. Um, three words to describe myself. Fun. Um, what do we do? Fun. Learner. Um, a friend. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? <laughs> Now, this is surveillance that may come back in the Yeah, future. I was going to say, this is going into your file, so. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, caution. <laughs> let's, go with, let's go with ice since it disappears. There you go. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, what's next? In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Let's go. Let's go first. I'm not familiar with this. So let's do first. For, that's an acceptable answer. Uh, <laughs> choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Uh, two celebrities to be my parents. Uh, is that the fifth one I was going to say while I'm thinking? Let's, uh, let's, let's come back to that. On the one. serial killer Celebr thing, I read something where someone said, uh, I would... Uh, hide the body somewhere, right, temporary. I would call in that the body was somewhere, like, out in the woods. They would go dig it up, not find the body. Yep. Then I'd move the body to that That's spot. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, you know, this is, okay. Maybe I said it. I'm not even <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think my answer was I would eat it. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like Damn. a win-win. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of somebody. I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> Kevin, there are no wrong answers on the parents. Yes, there are no wrong answers, and we won't we won't judge you at least in front of you anyway. We'll, we'll wait till after the show before yeah. we shoot. Oh yeah, <laughs> his answers were ridiculous. Let's let's just go with uh, the Obamas. <laughs> there you go, Kevin. Okay. Thank you so much for appearing on Paul's Security Weekly. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. Without taking a short break, come back. Bryson Bort's coming up next. Stay tuned.